Yeah, hello. <laughs> it's really nice that you joined us today. I'm a student in, in the last year. I'm working now my bachelor thesis. And well, I always I was always fascinated by space since I was little. I think it started by redesigning my room monthly <laughs> and not really playing with Lego or Playmobil or dolls, but building spaces for them. So I think it was kind of, <laughs> you know, you saw where it will go with me. And but what really got me about space and spatial design is that when you look around everything around us, all the rooms we, we we use, all the spaces we walk through, they're all designed and someone had to design them and hopefully design them for people, the people that they use. And that's not often the case. So I'm really eager to participate in that with spatial design to design rooms where people come together. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Dave? Yeah. Can we hear a bit about you? Dave, uh, also my last year of spatial design. Just a few things about me. I really love music and enjoy skateboarding. But about my work, or I can take my bachelor work as an example. As Elia said, uh, questioning sometimes this uh, function and sterility from spaces, specific uh, public spaces or cities. And uh, this is what I work with in my bachelor degree. So it's about structural interventions in public spaces. It's a really well-known method in art or in design as well. There are a lot of already works have been done to, in this process. But the different or the approach I go for as a spatial designer is in the beginning, there's not really a vision where you have to, to lead to, like a vision from an artist or a vision from a community. So you just start being on this place and designing this not really a physical space, more this mental space, this space of possibilities. So trying to reach the people, their needs in the in the process of making things, building things, like really simple and easy. And, uh, guide them a bit, like with the tools and everything. So because I uh, learned carpenter before I studied, so I have their skill. And uh, out of this process of making, the vision can blossom or it's not, yeah, out of this. And uh, so you can uh, really make a solid fundamental creation to develop or going more into a bigger and it's about uh, engineering or the investment that have to be taken for maybe a public space you really have solid substance from the community from the people that living in the cities based on what they build what they created together and my part is to design this mental possibilities space of possibility and not the the physics space giving things or giving furniture or giving options so that's a, a different approach for making interventions and getting an idea of space and getting people back to the relation of space yeah awesome. thank you so much i like this idea that we already feel which is this notion of you know it's not just about space as we usually believe you know like mental space options i'm, I'm already quite excited to hear and see how does that happen. Once more, a big thank you to you guys for taking the time to create all this material that you will share with us today. We are very grateful that you're spending all this time with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> We're gonna show you some insights in the project and on the room we're sitting in now. First off, we wanna ask you a question about this space. How would you feel in this work environment? Maya says uninspired with a question mark. Yeah. Would you want to work here? I would say too warm, seeing the, the ventilator. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to work in groups here, research, do some research? Federico says it depends on colleagues, but the space looks a bit flat. We have Anya saying, feels cluttered, ears, uh, hence clutters the mind. 
what this is, it's an office job, mechanical tasks. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's what we thought. <laughs> I mean, it it functions. It really functions as an office. It works, but you don't get the feeling that here is yeah. The the people in here are doing research, are experimenting, doing some inspiring work, and that's also why the head of the research group, Visual Narrative, contacted Faust as he said, and then we went together through this office last summer, and yeah, I thought it's just not really sexy in here. <laughs> so we needed to change that, but we were both rather new <laughs> to this process or to redesigning an office. We had a module about that with an amazing teacher. You're in here as, as well. <laughs> But yeah, we were new. And how would you proceed? How would you, as service designers, redesign that office? We have a few comments from the previous question. Yeah, Again, yeah. I, I'll come back to those so that people have time to sure. answer the two <laughs> questions. Luis, who says, it's planned, disorganized. <laughs> and uh, we have Deidre say, saying, more specifically, I hate seeing the back of large screens and plastic water bottle <laughs> trash cans. All could be more discreet and the plastic water bottle should go. And we have someone saying just thumbs up. And so Anya says how she would proceed, she said, understand why the, there is clutter or what actions create the clutter. And so bit of an observation of why it happened like that. We have my yeah saying, speak to the people who work there most frequently and ask what works about the current design, about the room, what doesn't work and why, and how they want to feel in their workspace. So not just being critical, but also seeing the value and also seeing a bit of a vision of where people like to go. Jose says, so first is asking, what are we trying to achieve here? Be more imaginative, more creative, more functional. You know, how do we want to feel? Is this for us? We have Sode saying, what things bother the employees of this office? Well, it's good to hear. <laughs> we had the same thoughts. Maybe you want to talk a bit about the process. Yes. Yeah, so... First, we started with, uh, with interviews with the people, check their needs, why is it the state of the art, talk with them, and really try to involve them in the process from the beginning. But then we made a kind of a, a board where we collect all the informations, and then we saw, okay, it needs more uh, <laughs> flexible spaces or more spaces where you can be in silence. And so we we really started out of these needs, rethinking the space. Yeah, and, and we especially asked the, the head of the research group, where do you want to go with the research group? What are future projects you're doing? Do you want to keep working like this or do you want to maybe do more workshops and really we really saw <laughs> we really saw a shift to more flexible work style to more meetings to more collaborating more workshops and also that they want to uh, represent their research groups and it's also important to say that here are two research groups sharing a space this was also something we discussed we discussed with the people here do you want to mix your groups? Can you imagine a space, like more co-working space where groups are mixed or do you want to keep them separate? But then you have, you know, the problems of really keeping them separate in an acoustic way and you need more space. And also there were new members of the research group. So we have to face more people. But in our survey, we also saw that a lot of people don't come here often. So we really wanted to do an office that, you know, gets people here again after Corona, but also 
yeah, so that the, the space is not used efficiently. We, yeah, everything signed to a bit of to co-working space or co-working space, like space. <laughs> and then it also was a really a big need for for the head of the research group bringing back the people to the office for this informal exchange. This was a big, big topic, especially after Corona and also for the creative part of the work, the spontaneous meeting with the coffee or in the cafeteria or outside. So, so the quality of the work can definitely develop. Yeah. We first worked on three different concepts. We got the, the shared concept, the, the co-working concept. We got like a semi-shared one and then the separated one. And we also presented those ideas to whole research groups and they all said, okay, now we want a shared co-working idea. But that was really good for us because we thought this is the best idea. And all, all the members said, yeah, let's go with that idea. And these are some first sketches this is how we proceeded we 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 thought about how or what work will will they do here is it more flexible work is it silent work focused work we got these three stones like the fixed stones this is more but first some people said they need a fixed desk like their own desk but that's completely shifted to flexible ones but more focused work, more loud meeting, collaborating work, and then this informal part. And then we just made those zones and proceeded further from that. I think it was a really valuable time when we could always pitch our ideas and a little bit shake off this old kind of work or how you work. And more and more people were getting to this idea of being flexible, having less stuff here open it up and it was also a really big part of the process in the beginning it it wasn't that everybody was like yeah let's share this space and get more to know each other of these groups and what we do but in the end of this time from working out the concept a lot of people get really enthusiastic about the idea so it was a big yeah. process, and I think it really depended on that we always uh, pitched the the possibilities we can make uh, and to talk to the to the people that have to work here in the end. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really important. I mean, we don't design space for us; we design it for the people that use them. So these are more detailed sketches and first sketches. Uh, we try to use a lot of furniture that was already here, but notice that, yeah, not all of it makes really sense in here. And, and also there was a lot, a lot, a lot of storage with a lot of junk, I say. <laughs> and there are a lot of things that people don't really use. So we said, okay, storage needs to be minimized. But of course, yeah, we still need some storage, desk, the informal ones. So uh, after a lot of sketching and redo the the base or the, the plan, we did the first 3D models of uh, giving an impression of what can be, and also pitched it again and really worked on the top. You see with the with the noise, where is more noise, where is less noise. So I think the whole acoustic was was until then not really our focus. And then it was like, oh, okay, when we do it like this, there is going to be a loud, a louder zone where people talk, and then you have this green focused zone. So the the sketching and drawing was it had to be done again. <laughs> and what really helped, we often worked here in the space itself. During the day, but mostly in the evening. <laughs> but that really helped to be in the space that you are creating and then seeing and discussing in in real life where to put things and uh, to see the measurements. Yeah, um, I think was, yeah. <laughs> with the back with the acoustic, when you see it, the, the red parts are the loud parts and the green parts are the more silent parts. It was a really shit idea to split 
with the green in the middle, mm -hmm. the two red ones. So we, <laughs> re, for a really long time, we didn't saw that. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah, and it's, it's easy now when you see it, but <laughs> to get these two sounds and yeah. split by us. It yeah. was uh, it was a long process, and we got some good help. I can really say that we went to different furniture offices. vendors, vendors, yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> producers, and and pitched our ideas, and, and they really gave us so much feedback, and also with with an old mentor of us, an old lecturer, she helped us really to see <laughs> stuff like that and to improve our design further and further and further. Yeah, so here was a lot of mentoring and mm. talking to people that are already yeah. in the business and we just... Uh, and I, yeah. I mean, we needed that. We're students, but I think it's also very helpful if you do that still when you're, when you're good or when you're like finished, you're never finished in your job, but... Yeah, after your studies. Yeah, to share your experience and to keep experience. Like Get today. experience from others, like today. Then we did some first renderings to really get a feeling for the space, also for the other people, for the members of the research group to show how it can look. Because yeah. for a lot of people, it's it's difficult to read a plan and to to imagine then the space. After and, all this uh, technic work with where is the light and where is transition rooms, then we figured it out and then we can start with this emotional design and mm -hmm. that's why we did the first renderings with a color plate and yeah, so that's definitely one of the uh, methods we learned and we used. So don't start with colors and fancy stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Here you see on the mood board, see our color palette, we work with the colors that are in the room here, and then added more of those earth tones, warm tones, the orange from the school. And what was really special about this project is that we, in the beginning, we had a small budget. The, the project got bigger and bigger. <laughs> yeah. We kept it going bigger and bigger. But we had to ask for sponsors, for sponsoring for the first time. That was a huge experience <laughs> to walk yeah. in there to a furniture vendor and say, hey, we got this idea, please sponsor the furniture. <laughs> um, we didn't do it like this. <laughs> yeah, we, we pitched it. These are like parts of the, of the uh, slide we showed them mm -hmm. for pitching the project. And of course we had to, the name of the Hochschule Luzern, so it was definitely easier to go for a sponsoring. <laughs> but the first one we went <laughs> after we pitched, he was like, yeah, "No one gonna buy it." Like, fuck that. So <laughs> it's it's really crap, and you don't really sell it, and it sounds like you're not really a nice, a uh, lucrative like for him for him making an investment, like a really lucrative idea. So he was. But he was in the end, he was kind. He was like, okay, you can have you some, need. some, yeah, what you wanted. And, but when you do it with other vendors, you, they don't gonna sponsor you because mm -hmm. it's really, yeah, not business like how you did it. You were just like more like, can we have some furniture, please? Or, and, yeah, that was, and he was like straight up to our faces. Yeah. That was really, I'm gonna buy it. To, yeah. to fail. Yeah, we really first failed time. at the first one. Yeah. <laughs> and then, I mean, all the other meetings went very well. Yeah. So, he and he sponsored so. as well. And in the end, he said, okay. Yeah, he also gave us a, a feedback or a, yes. a kind of little lesson that's not going to work in the business world, that's maybe going to work in the school. But, but that was. Lovely. And after this lesson, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we didn't fail the, the others uh, there. Yeah. So. Big learning. Um, and I think, I don't know how, how you guys do that or see that, but for us, it was very difficult to, to sell the idea and not to sell yourself under your, your worth, your value. And um, that was really difficult to stay there. This is my design. You need to sponsor us. This is good because of that and that and that. I think maybe that is a little bit of a problem as a designer, a problem you face all the time. But we got the sponsoring, 
there in this room is now the the furniture has worked three times as the amount we paid. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. Then this was the the finishing layout for with the list where it's like with the how much it costs, how many pieces, the name of the pieces, so the exact list for every physic piece object in the room. Yes, so this was the Sorry. this this we showed to the head of the research group in the end, after all talking with all the sponsoring and everything. And we had the in in one week we had to go to for the money and we can order everything. And yeah, then start the build up. So <laughs> yeah, we have to we we painted a lot of the room by ourselves, basically everything. Yeah, we did um, a lot in in the free time. Free time. Yeah, beside the, the school worked at night and everything and have to build up with the with the people that brought the furniture and so the, yeah, just, the cost's not going to be that big because for a painter, it's, yeah, yeah, it's really expensive for, for painting all these walls. Yeah. <laughs> and it was also, it was a good experience to lead, you know, the build up. Build up, yes. And also participate in the mm -hmm. build up and get our hands dirty after all that thinking work. <laughs> yeah. Now really doing it and seeing it and seeing it get together. That was that was great. So yeah, we, we already come to the to the end. To yeah. the end. <laughs> These are some looks, uh, some pictures how it looks now. We also integrated art from the school in here from the student. That was just very important to do that. To give this opportunity, and now it's the idea. It's also a bit of an invisible space because the 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 wall is going to change. So every half year or after the semester, a new student can exhibit in exchange for a, for a, for money, mm -hmm. a work, an artwork on the wall. So it's kind of off space mm -hmm. with the, and the the art's going to change. So everybody has the possibility. And this is more like a flexible zone. This is where we are seated now. This can really change. It's for, for workshops, for small groups. This is really an active dynamic zone. This is more the, the focused work zone with the screens. You can plug in your laptop and work on a second screen. This is also very important in here because a lot of the people work with their laptops or writing and writing papers. So that's needed as well. And it got a lot greener, it got more color, more of those warm tones. This one feels more homely. I'm going to show them again. Cool. Thanks for sharing so much. I'm taking a minute to make a bit of a summary of a few yes, of please. the learnings that I've gathered as you were speaking, to me, it's quite interesting to see one approach that you guys have, which is this repetitive pitching. You said this really well, this notion that, oh, I'm going to pitch an idea, a new idea. And, and, and by this process of coming back always again and again to people with these ideas, you slowly also help people to go from a bit in a process of change because they hear that, oh, something else is possible. And they hear it again and again and again and again. And it's quite, quite interesting for me when I see how you said, oh, at the beginning, it was very clear that people just wanted their space. They're very like, this is my space. Please protect my little computer and my sticky notes. Don't touch them. And slowly you made it possible. I'm quite amazed when I hear that. And when I see this room, how it is now, having something which is very shared. And I, I, I find it's quite interesting, this notion of helping people to change also perspectives by pitching openly to the users. Hey, what if it was like this? What if it was like that? How would you feel? Is this good? Is this... And then coming again and again and slowly changing minds also in, in some way. It changes also your mind because obviously you, you, you get some feedback too. And that's quite something interesting. So as a research method, like this repetitive pitching is one 
element that I heard, which was quite quite interesting. Another part that you expressed quite quite strongly, and I come back to you, is this idea of being part of the space. So that's something that I think is quite strong. Also, this nice idea of hey, if I'm going to change something here, I first need to be more an indigenous and to feel how it is before transforming anything. So before I break something, I need to know how it will feel when, once I break it, which is quite, Im quite, quite important. To the pitching, you had something more to add. Please go yeah, on. I just wanted to say maybe, well, yeah, we pitched a lot, but also we just talked a lot yeah. with the people, not always pitching our ideas, but really talking together. We, we talked a lot. <laughs> you spent the time. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. invested in the relationships. Yes, yeah, I think that's very helpful and, and to get to know the members that are working in here, also through the interviews firstly, but then coming back here again in the space, talking to the people, asking, hey, what are you doing? What are you working on? Yeah. So definitely being part of the space, being part of the community, and if we summarize it in a, yeah. in a very short way, you have also this idea, which is, I think, quite valuable for us as service designers. Sometimes we are very abstract, you know, we have service blueprints, we have some crazy mirror boards, and then people look at this and say, what the fuck is that, you know? <laughs> and I think yeah. you had this translation too, where you, you made your architectural plans and people looked at it and say, wow, nice lines, awesome. I don't know what this is. And then with the renderings, with a few ele visual elements, you transform it's into a language that people can understand. I think that's also something that is quite impressive in how you worked. Another thing that I picked up quite strongly is this notion that you say that you take different spaces for different ways of working. I think for services, we are often thinking into trying to create one experience for everyone, you know? Yeah. And I hear, I feel it's very different. It's like, oh, this is one space that has to accommodate many different experiences. So this is some is a shift that I find is extremely interesting for us as service designer, not thinking of in one experience, but how can we create one flow that allows multiple experiences? And then something that I think is extremely important in what you're saying to us is it's okay to get help. Yeah. You know, and this reminder of hey, even if you're the best, the best guy, sometimes it's good to have an outside perspective looking for a mentor, looking for a colleague who can help. Sometimes just asking the builders, the partners, the, the vendors, hey, uh, this is my idea. What do you think? Which furniture would work best? Uh, could be the same for services. I mean, even if it's digital, you speak with vendors of software and stuff and ask them, hey, we want, we want to try to create this. What do you think? And I think it's, it, it, it's quite interesting also to see how one of your big failures was one of your big learning too. This moment of, hey, it's okay that we just miserably failed, you know, and the guy said, hey, you pitched yourself so badly that even if you sucked, I'm going to give you one or two furniture, <laughs> which is okay, good, yeah. yeah. But then it, it gave you the lessons. And I think this is also a reminder for us that it's okay that we jump in fields that we are not comfortable yet. For example, for you, it was the kind of business part and just mm -hmm. jumping in it, failing miserably, and then because people usually are nice and they say, you failed, please do it like that because I don't want to see you fail again. Yeah. And, and then this happens and then you learn and, and obviously the, the learning is more stronger once you smash down your face <laughs> that usually then it, it sucks very well. So thanks already for all these little nuggets that you shared with us. So we wanted to ask you, what would you do Differently, we showed you our process. Are there things you would do in a different way or things you would add to the process or things you'd say, oh no, you forgot that. That would be so important if you would have done, I don't know, a gathering of all people and eat together. Or, you know, what, what are your experiences as service designers? What do you think should be done as well or differently in this process? And while you're reflecting, I'll jump back in time slowly because we had answers that we didn't pick up previously when your question was, how would you, what would you proceed? I'm going to take a, a little bit of time to jump back in time and then we'll have new answers to take. Did we send, spend some time observing and hearing comments without drawing answers out in structured way? So basically being 
having a he an ear in the space and hearing people say, oh, these fucking electrical plugs, I fucking hate them. And then you're like, okay, electrical plugs, we have to fix that, you know? And ah, oh, the blinds, it's always so warm in here. Okay, and then hearing that. And quite interestingly here, without asking questions, but being in the space, why these bugs, these pain points happen so that you can observe them and, and take them. Definitely a very good way to, to get all of these elements. On your side, so one question is, who was the end client? So in, in, in order to answer your question, what would you do differently? Would you define your end client as the head of the, the research program or was it the people who use the space or did, did you have multiple clients? How, how did you work with that? I think a multiple client. So the first way, uh, the head of this uh, research group with this big issue, this big need, it has to change here something, which is kind of coming out and like, well, we have to change here. Also the people that work here were, for me, they're also clients because they were really involved in this process. And also the, the whole department, uh, design and art, or like their representation or their value as well for, as an art and design school working in this uh, really shitty places and being creative in like really, uh, yeah, that space is kind of, it's really stimulating. So we had there also kind of a, a client for me as well. And it can also spread even to the other departments as well from uh, Lucerne, from the university. But also the, the facility manager. Yes, the facility you, manager. You cannot do everything here in these spaces and not for all the money. Mm -hmm. that you, so that, that was also the reason that you look for sponsors because yes. the budget were, were, was not so high, but there must also be trusted to, let's say, bachelor students, young mm -hmm. bachelor students. Okay doing here and working on this space, creating a new space. I think that's that was also very important that you also yeah, having Nicole in the in the process, keeping her updated. And I think that's yeah. So definitely one thing that we hear from that question is realization that you have multiple clients and that multiple stakeholders with different needs and that you have to, to play with all them and you have I think a quite good understanding of that that you have the one who's paying the one who's then managing the one who's living in it but definitely not paying for it and that these different needs and and tasks have to also be managed yeah that also changed during the process I mean first it was just the head of the research who came with the problem then we've seen, okay, there are a lot of members using these rooms. Yeah. So that came and then the project got bigger and the, the interest in the project grew also from the department side. So then there came the third client, let's yeah. say. That's quite interesting also because that shows that this is something that evolves. The, for, yeah. the, the client that, that, start, that you start with is not the clients you end with. Because more that. people join, more needs come and are shown. So one person, Jose, is putting in his hand up. So you can slowly unmute yourself and maybe answer that question. Hi, everyone. And congratulations on the work. I believe this is like a real big job just for students. And congratulations on that. I just, I, I don't know if I've done it differently, though. I may have had like more participation from the stakeholders. Like, as you said, you had multiple stakeholders throughout the uh, journey. And I think that maybe they have something that they can share or they can add to the project. Something like maybe if you wanted some more sponsors, maybe they had some of the furniture that you needed, maybe adding this furniture to the places that, the, that you were creating, people were like, Maybe they very they may have been like feel more involved in the in the end product. I don't know if I've I've gone out like asking for for sponsors on on furniture stores. Maybe I've asked, asked people, asked the university, asked, asked I don't know if you have like a workshop school part of the school that they create a furniture for for the school for for inner project. Maybe you could have asked them. I've come up with ideas to to 
that they don't usually have a, like a lot of resources to work with. So they tend to call to the community to ask for help. And this usually has like a big impact on the end result because people think to think that they have added something to the end result and they see it there every day. So maybe, I don't know if you've done it differently, though I add that to the project that you have done, to the work that you have done like having more involvement with the community with the end result someone asked for the prototype something like that how about asking people creating a co contest for people to participate on this contest something like that so so you can sometimes like have a different approach to the budget not only on the money itself but also with the work that people may be willing to do just that and congratulations again so much I'll say we have so a few ideas in what you say. I'm gonna summarize it in a few words. We have this idea of maybe you know bring your own device, maybe bring your own furniture. There is a bit of an idea like that. So bring it, letting people take take the space with with their stuff, letting people also part having maybe workshops or ways to involve the stakeholders even more. I think you did already a good basis work there and, and it's kept it's possible to go obviously even, even further. And you hinted at something that was in the chat. And so I will read that for the people in the room, which is Federico says, have you done some prototyping, rearranging the old furniture before, before the call makeover? Maybe you have a few insights on how you worked in the prototyping phase of this space. Yes, we worked with the, the tables and everything that was inside here. And the, there's still three of them in, inside here. And the, the rest we made with the, with the storage. We made like a zones or a switch them. And maybe like this could be a diner so to see the, the measurement and the dimension. It can be maybe a booth and could also the size of uh, two storages there, so we can get them really up an idea. And put, yeah, we did a lot with these black storage boxes and <laughs> the tables to make to imitate this big long table as well here. And then, yeah, so. But we didn't like change the room and leave the room like that for mm -hmm. some time and then get feedback but it was it just wasn't possible because a, whole, a lot of people still had their own desk a lot of furniture storage and those desks were really really big and yeah that yeah, was at that point just not possible but we still see this i mean it's a very very beautiful type <laughs> but but as a space that can evolve and change mm -hmm. and we will in a few weeks gather feedback from the people that work now about the year here and then yeah to evolve the space further but in the prototyping phase like David said yeah. but not with the using the yeah. just yeah. with the dimension but not yeah. the, the using of the space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there is way more stuff that was done, experimented, than the few slides that you showed. And I think we are quite quite aware that there is a lot of work that is hidden that that, that, that was done too. I'd love now maybe to that we move to the next part, yes. if that's okay for you guys, yes. that we move a bit more in the exercise yes. part. <laughs> and then we'll go in the end again with a bit of a question time from the audience. And, and a bit of a hangout time at the end. Okay. Sure, yes. I'm going to show the Miro board. So ah, yes. now you well, maybe all have access to the Miro board. One second. Sorry for that. <laughs> Just what we would do different now is, yes, more prototyping, more involving the schools, actually something we also thought about. And what we did oh, to explain this project, this redesigning of the, the offices has a second project. There are more offices to redesign and we will do that. And in the second process, we also use workshops as a tool yeah. to do so, workshop to really kind of co-design in, yes. in the first part, yeah. first step. Working this one to see 
a plan and then we do like zones and we had like really small dimension for tables and stools and you could in a playful way rearrange all the rooms and in the end it also was the idea or to do this rearrangement with the furnitures first and see as it as an open space. So as it was mentioned, so yeah, we tried to work more with that too. Yeah, yeah. that we didn't we didn't have done this in the first one. It's really good to see you now that um, in learnings that you told us, hey, you could do that as yeah, well. Even more, yeah, push it more. Yeah. I think there's a lot of potential these workshops and using things that are already there and you bringing all personal things and doing this kind of creative exercises yeah. with the people so that was, that was yeah that was, this is what we do differently wonderful and as you said it's oh. it's a version one of the space yes. it's going to continue to to evolve and we're and obviously we're, we're quite excited to see how that will evolve. Maybe in one or two years, we can do another event and see how it all changed. <laughs> yes, hopefully. <laughs> we always already have good questions from Federico because he is the guy <laughs> asking good questions in this community. I was thinking while looking at your impressive work, congratulations about the, the job you have done. It's remarkable, especially, and no offense, as a bachelor level project is very, very exciting especially as a service designer the way you approach the problem imagine myself in my bachelor having that kind of clearance in view in the process would have been very as uh, useful and helpful to be say to the question it's about the use of let's say color and friendly environment in the space because i mean for example google works workspaces are famous to be friendly and playful and colorful only in where the creative people work then you have all the standard offices where business people and stuff are always the same the office of banks and insurance company the swiss ones let's say are all kind of the same what what's your what are your thoughts about it why the color and the playful environment is only at least in my not experienced perception perception only for the people in creative roles and should it be expanded outside? How do you feel about that? Well, I agree. <laughs> that surely is the case a lot of times. And I mean, if you, it kind of makes sense, you know, okay, creative people, they need colorful rooms and this and that, they need to play. But I think it would be important to also give the more structured work, more desk work, also this, this possibility. And I also think that there will be a change for sure. I add one more thing to narrow down the, the topic. Do you think that this kind of playful and colorful spatial design has a real influence on the quality of work life and the quality of work that people can produce in the environment? I think it doesn't have to go as far as Google <laughs> with, yeah, they, they go really crazy, but for sure, yes. I mean, it, it helps playing, it helps communicate with others, it helps spontaneous things to happen where you can learn from. It, it really helps with, with innovation, yeah, with innovating ideas, so I think absolutely. I have a weird study for you, Rico. I think it's prisons, some prisons for people who drank too much or are violent. So might be an urban legend. So please verify the sources. But I think they were done, they have done some studies where they changed the, the color of the room mm -hmm. to measure how angry the people got in these rooms. And I think pink worked really well to bring down the level of brutality from drunk people uh, you know when they are put in these solitary rooms and so color based on that has really an emotional impact on the person so that's one example but i'm sure maybe you class have a bit more experience on maybe usage of how color has been used in the past to 
help people change behaviors and make people more comfortable? Yeah, I think where 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 a lot is going on now or since the eighties is in the in the realm of healthcare and well being. For example, in hospitals and hospitals, there are a lot of studies. I don't remember the name, but there was once a, once a study about a long time a long time study about people who have a certain disease and have to stay a long time in the hospital. And they found out that if people, if the patients look out of the window on a, on a brick wall, they recover quite slowly than someone who is looking out of the, of the window into a natural, into nature on a tree. There was a tree. They, do, they need less medicine. They need, they recover quicker. They're, well, this is an early study. And there's now, it's re relatively new, the Swiss Center for the Design and Health, also in Switzerland, and they're dealing also with well-being or with health, this design and health, but not necessarily in the in the field of health care. It's not only hospitals, they're also looking for yeah, dealing with problems or with issues in, in workplace. Yeah. And so I know also that this workplace methods are also now transferred more in the, in the direction of hospitals. Because on the one hand, there are patients, but on the other hand, also there, there are working people in a hospital. And I think you, there's a lot of things going on. There are a lot of studies. I think color is also important. I think it's more also what you see if you look outside, if you have the feeling of, yeah, there's nature. I think with colors always is kind of subjective, subject, subjective, subjective. We have one, I know, a, a master thesis now. She's dealing with color in space and what, what it makes with the people. And she's did a lot of experiments and workshops, but the, the result is very, they are very diverse. So it's very, it's a very individual thing, but I th I'm pretty sure that there are also studies about different, the use of color in space and what it will do, but I'm not sure. I think there's, there are not, there's no evidence about that specific color you know, gives a specific mood. But it's always, I think, I'm, I'm a friend of testing and looking and to make it make it flexible i think yeah you can make it fancy color or i think that it makes something with the space but it's but i'm thinking yeah as i said this um, topic of health that you can really trans there's a lot there's a lot of evidence that you can that it's going more and more will be transferred also to workplace and i think workplace is not a place only where you work but i think that's also why google is doing that that workplace is also a place where you live you spend a lot of time in this in this space so they should be as good as the place yeah at, at home for example where you live you know so what you know now Federico is you have the good keywords for your search in Google Scholar which is healthcare <laughs> healthcare architecture impact of colors also looking at cultural differences in perception of color. I think these are very interesting topics also to go and search evidence. And also, I think Klaus said it very well, is go out and try stuff. I think that's that's something what we're giving you, I think today, what the people here are giving us is to say, hey, you can play with the room as you play with experiences. So feel okay to play with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one one thing I want to add, I think it's more about the atmosphere in a space mm -hmm. than only color. And atmosphere is something that you can, that is that is very uh, you you think you have it in your hand and understand, and suddenly it's gone. But, but there are also I know there are, there's there are also studies about that in literature. For example, Barbara Mutzbauer, she's also a lecturer with us. She she made her PhD about atmosphere, and this is a, this is, then it becomes complex, and you cannot uh, yeah there are, it's. Yeah, it's not, you cannot uh, create evidence about this. It's more about experiencing and, and searching for different yeah, um, notions about that. Yeah. I see we have comments or questions from Deidre from Buenos Aires. Uh, thank you all very much. I just wanted to share with you, I can put it in the chat, a link to the page. There is a financial institution here in Buenos Aires and they have a world-class art collection. They started collecting art, the, the partners from all over the world, but now they've made it a regional and a, a national collection. And it's a banking institution. It's, so 
everybody's desk is as it would be in what you would imagine, Federico, as you mentioned, like a regular or financial office. But there are paintings, sculptures, installations all throughout the working space. So I first visited it during COVID. So there were about six people in an office of 200 and just art. And, you know, somebody left their flask or their water bottle or some messy desk. And so it was emptiness and art. And they opened the collection once a week to visitors. And so you can walk through their office. So they can be distracted by the art. They can be distracted by the visitors. One of the pieces was a, a movie by an artist called Nicola Constantini, who puts herself into different characters and they had it in the boardroom and they had to remove it because the, uh, the, the people were getting distracted <laughs> by this moving artwork, which was very beautiful. So it's another idea. I'm going to share the link to the page, which is also in English, and I will do that now. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing that. Again, Welcome. maybe for you, Federico, I know you like studies and stuff. So I'm mentioning that also. There is a very interesting study on pain management and art. Showing beautiful pictures to people is has sometimes the same effect as a good painkiller. So there is also, again, something that is very useful for when you're dealing with space and having to convince someone that it has importance, that art has an importance, just being able to translate the value in an Excel spreadsheet sometimes is useful to convince the one who is deciding and has an Excel spreadsheet, right? Uh, definitely. Okay. Jose, you have one question also. Let's go. Well, more than a question, I always come with uh, some comment. From... <laughs> but I just uh, class, it is class, right? Sorry. The uh, uh, professor? Yeah. Class, yes. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry. It's uh, something that sparked my mind and it was like, it's a big part of our life it happens in our office. And for me, it was like, how do we design these spaces that don't actually feel like home? So some people don't feel like they are really trapped in an office. Like, oh, I have to spend all my life here in this office. For instance, I was reading sometime that, uh, uh, sometime ago that I read that for instance, in Google and Meta, they have these gym offices that you can go and practice some exercises there. And they are like, okay, so even Apple has them. And it's like, okay, so you want me to be here all the time, even when I'm exercising, I'm eating. So you're giving me everything. You don't want me to go home. So you want me here. Like, like it's, it's more like you're in prison rather than at work. So you make it so cozy just to get into that mindset for you to be working all the time and that you lose track of, of time. It's like when in, in the in the casino, people have like this oxygen thing that they just push it into the casino so people stay there for longer. It's just, just a thought that it came to my mind that we need to be like really, need to really understand the powerful words sometimes that it, it, it could be read like really good, but also really bad from some perspective. That's my comment. Thank you, guys. The ethical question of creating a <laughs> space, workspace, which is too good that even that home then feels like a place that you hate and therefore you spend more place in your work. How do you deal with this kind of uh, philosophical questions about when, when is a workplace too good? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or did yeah. that already happen yeah I, I know this question yeah i think there's always you have always this two sides yeah i think it's uh, if it, if google is doing it or apple or amazon then it's yeah it's it's clear you if you if you well i know working is more yeah i think it's in the future is more uh, going to another community you have the family at home but sometimes you go to an office i have also I work here at the university, for example. I, I like it very much because, yeah, colleagues are getting friends. <laughs> Let's say this is also the, the, on the personal level. But also, yeah, I, I like the spaces here. But I also like to go home because the space there is completely different. Here is design and art. Sometimes you don't see it because the spaces don't look like design and art. But it, 
at home it's completely different for example my wife is not a designer the kids are yeah for sure they are creative and it looks totally messy at home <laughs> always in the weekend i have to clean up but in, in basel where i live i also have an office space where also other colleagues are so i think it's it's always interesting to have different places where you go and they have a, a certain let's say for me a certain character that, that you go there and meeting different people i think this moving around is also very very important and i think it's also i see, see it also critical to have only one space yeah like at google it's super nice you have also a gym there where you have to go you can eat there you can go out so you have a bar like for example novartis campus in basel also where it's a complete city you don't have to leave there uh, there's i think i don't know if they also have a hotel for sure they have spaces where you can stay the whole night if you're doing research and you don't want to go home and it really feel i've, I've been there once and it feels really like a a city a city and like a gated community where you go and you're in this bubble and i see this also critical i think it goes more in the direction that you have different places also in the city for example I, what i like very much this idea from from in Buenos Aires, we have this kind of, you have a place where you, where you can look at art that is also open for the public, where you have a cafe, where you can work. It's it's a co-working space that you really move around and find the place where you, you can work very well. But in this point of view, I think um, this is not the point of view of Apple or Google because they have another thing in mind. It's not, I think, yeah, they, they want to give a good workplace good environment a good a good feeling to work there but the other hand on the other hand they also always have the also the numbers in mind uh, i think there's also the i have to say the war of talents yeah like we have to see that that you also can make advertisement for your own com for the company to get the best people you give them uh, different things opportunities nice spaces good food a gym everything for free and then you got the best talents i think this is also an economical thing where where big companies are have better chances to get to get the, the, the new talents coming Adam. i think there is something quite interesting in what you're saying which is creating community not replacing community yeah which is work is another community yes. mm -hmm. and shouldn't replace all the other exactly, communities. Yeah, I think, yeah. And I think that's where the ethical question comes is, is the workplace replacing home, replacing other stuff? Mm -hmm. And it's just centralized yeah, the yeah. bubble of, of work or is it adding space? Is yeah. it adding a new community? And I really love this idea that if it's multiple spaces, then people are forced to move from one place to another. They meet new people. There is some, some entity in the middle. And instead of just having a bubble of perfection, mm -hmm. we go again to this notion of natural, yeah, 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 where exactly. you have to move, you have to change, which is a very interesting idea. So we have this notion of going from perfect to natural that comes again and again. Mm -hmm. and, and also this idea that of creating community, not replacing community. I have a question which is very concrete and very practical. So if a service designer has to work with a space, and sadly, he can't hire a spatial designer to work with him because, you know, budgets are limited or he doesn't know one. What is one trick, one tip that you will say, please do that. And you're already doing something good. Uh, I think go to this, this place, you have to design. And one time you see it full busy with everybody, with the people. And then you go on the next day when it's empty or on the time and you check out the same space from the same position when it's empty. So be in the space multiple times at different times and yes. to see the differences. Yes, like probably the, the crazy change from busy to empty. So I think That's having cool. these two crazy relations so you can yeah. design for the full range yeah, of uses. Range. Yeah. Wonderful. What will be your advice? <laughs> Just speaking to the people and getting to know what they need because they need the space. So you should get to know them and what they do. So get to know people, understand what they do and why they are doing it here. Yeah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Think about experience and interactions in space first and then about the furniture. So I think this is the, the thing. Uh, yeah. So furniture comes second. Well, my first idea was yeah, to observe. 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 Wonderful. 
So let's stay exactly on that. So next time you have to design a space, observe, observe multiple times at multiple moments. Ask people, what are you doing here? Why are you doing it here? Think about first the interactions and then the furniture. And remember, it's all about creating a context where not just one context, but may maybe also different contexts. And that's one thing that we learned, which is a bit different than what we do sometimes in survey design. Thank you, everyone. I want to thank again, Ria, Dave, and Klaus for hosting this event, for sharing your knowledge. Remember, you can always go on SDN Switzerland in Google to find the next events. Thank you so much for joining. Cheers. Thank you.